On June 21st, 1964, three activists, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Swerner, were kidnapped and killed in Philadelphia, Mississippi during the Civil Rights Movement. They had been participating in the 1964 Freedom Summer Campaign, which sought to register African Americans to vote in Mississippi. And if this is the type of content that you enjoy, you can find more content like this at OneLikeHistory.com. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so on Bobby Coffee and my Patreon page in the description below. Please give me five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. But without further ado, let's get started. In the early 1960s, Mississippi and other southern states fiercely resisted federal efforts to implement racial integration. Recent Supreme Court rulings had upset the establishment in Mississippi, and they had responded with open hostility. So as the summer of 1964 approached, white Mississippians braced for an influx of northern college students who had been recruited to assist with the voter registration drive. The media reported exaggerated numbers of youths expected, which prompted a surge in Ku Klux Klan membership numbers in Mississippi. By the time of the summer's arrival, the Klan had more than 10,000 members in the state. During the summer of 1964, members of the Ku Klux Klan burned down 20 African-American churches in Mississippi. On Memorial Day of that year, Michael Schwerner and Jane Cheney gave a speech at the Mount Zion Methodist Church in Longdale, Mississippi, encouraging the congregation to register to vote and inquire about setting up a freedom school. However, the Ku Klux Klan found out about Swerner's voter drive and formulated a plan to impede their progress. They attacked the congregational members and set the church on fire in a calculated attempt to draw the civil rights activists to Neshoba County. However, Michael Schwerner was not in the church that day. He had gone to Oxford, Ohio to work with a new group of Freedom Summer volunteers. But upon returning to Mississippi, Michael Schwerner, Andrew Goodman, and James Cheney would visit the destroyed Mount Zion Church. Afterward, they were stopped by law enforcement who knew the car they were driving was associated with the Congress for Racial Equality. Cheney, the driver, was charged with driving 65 in a 35 zone, and Schwerner and Goodman was held for investigation and taken to a local Philadelphia jail in Neshoba County. At 4.45 p.m., when the trio had still not returned, the core staff began calling nearby jails and police stations, but didn't learn anything. In Philadelphia, Mississippi, despite the fact that fines for speeding were posted on the wall, the Neshoba County Deputy Sheriff Cecil Price refused Swerner's request to make a phone call and inform the three men that they would remain in jail until the Justice of the Peace arrived to process the three fines, and afterwards, he left the jail. He would return later at 10 p.m. without the Justice of the Peace, collected the fines, and told the three men to leave the county immediately. This would be the last time the three men were ever seen alive. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover had reluctance to get involved in the search for the three missing men and had to be convinced by then-President Lyndon B. Johnson. Because of the Lindenburg Law in 1932, which made kidnapping fall under federal jurisdiction, and Mississippi was the only state without a central FBI office, so Jago Hoover initially ordered agents for Meridian to begin a preliminary search. On June 23, 1964, the FBI launched an inquiry into the suspicious disappearance of three civil rights activists in Neshoba County, Mississippi, shrouding it under the name of Myburn, short for Mississippi Burning. The investigation faced numerous roadblocks from the outset. The local police force and the public were deeply steeped in racism and displayed hostility towards the agents. The police in particular were uncooperative and were suspected of aiding in the kidnapping, forcing the FBI to bring in more agents from across the country to help with the investigation. On June 22nd, United States Attorney Robert F. Kennedy escalated the search and sent 150 federal agents from New Orleans. The next day, investigators found the core station wagon. It was still smoldering in an attempt to burn evidence, and this shifted the focus from a rescue to a recovery operation. The case drew national attention, in large part due to the fact that the victims, Schwerner and Goodman, were white northerners. Even Michael Schwerner's wife, Rita stated that the slaying of a Negro in Mississippi is not news. It's only because my husband and Andrew Goodman are white that the national alarm has been sounded. Throughout July, investigators searched the woods, fields, swamps, and rivers of Mississippi and found the remains of at least eight other lynched black men. The FBI received assistance from the Naval Reserve, which sought to dredge rivers for potential bodies. Finally, on August 4th, 44 days after their murder, 
an informant led the FBI to the body of Swerner Cheney and Goodman, buried in earth and dam on the property of a local businessman and a known Klan sympathizer by the name of Olin Burridge. Throughout the fall of 1964, the FBI would continue to investigate the case, but state and local law enforcement officials simply would not pursue it, claiming that they had insufficient evidence. Because murder is a crime that falls under state law, Mississippi officials simply refused to prosecute any killers for the murders. So the Justice Department instead, on December 4th, charged 21 men with conspiring to violate Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman's civil rights. Prosecutors for the federal government brought charges before a grand jury, which indicted Sheriff Lawrence A. Rainey, Deputy Sheriff Cecil Price, and 16 other men in January of 1965. The following month, in February 24, 1965, federal judge William Harold Cox, an ardent segregationist, dismissed the charges against a majority of the defendants on the ground that the other 17 had not acted under color of state law, which basically means the abuse or misuse of power by an official only because he is an official. Well, the prosecution appealed, and in 1966, the Supreme Court reinstated the charges, ruling that the law applied to both law enforcement officials as well as civilians. So, in October of 1967, the case of the United States versus Cecil Price began in the courtroom again with Judge William Harold Cox. The jury consisted of seven white men and five white women as defense attorneys had exercised all of their peremptory challenges against all 17 potential black juries. On the first day of the trial, defense attorneys asked a witness if Schwerner had been part of a plot to rape white women during the Freedom Summer Project 1964. And Judge Cox immediately deemed the question was improper and declared that I'm not going to allow a farce be made of this trial. John Doerr, the prosecuting attorney, later described that moment where Judge Cox answered the rape question as a crucial milestone in a mission for justice. Doerr asserts that if the court had any sense that it was being accused of being immune to conviction in Mississippi, that feeling was immediately eliminated when Cox voiced his opinion. His response made it evidently clear that this trial would be taken seriously and now was enough to make the jury pay attention and take their responsibilities very seriously. The prosecution presented a 1964 confession of Horace Doyle Barnett and James Jordan, which described the events of that night's murders. According to the confession, Cecil Price, the law enforcement officer, contacted Edgar Ray Killian, a Baptist minister and prominent member of the Ku Klux Klan. Killian then ordered the Klan members to gather in Philadelphia. After Price released the civil rights workers from the jail, the Klansmen followed them in their cars. Eventually, the men were stopped on Highway 19, where James Jordan shot Cheney and Wayne Roberts shot Schwerner and Goodman. The killers then drove the core station wagon containing the bodies to the old Jolly Farm, where they were buried in an earthen dam with the use of a bulldozer. During deliberations, the jury was deadlocked on its decision. Judge Cox employed the Allen charge, which is a jury instruction given to a hung jury, urging them to come to an agreement on a verdict. October 20th. 1967, seven defendants were found guilty of murder of civil rights workers in Mississippi. This marked the first ever convictions in Mississippi for such a crime. However, the jury was deadlocked 11 to 1 in favor of the conviction for three defendants, including the minister. The prosecution decided not to retry the case, so Edgar Ray Killian was allowed to walk free. Those who were found guilty were given sentences between 3 and 10 years, and none of them served more than six years in prison. In the aftermath, the outcome of the trial exacerbated public sentiment. Although there were numerous people involved in the murders, only seven were even convicted and their sentences were relatively light. This was buried between the brutal crime and the punishment sparked national outrage. The evidence of racial bias in the justice system had the public demanding legislative changes to combat these deeply ingrained inequalities. In 1998, Jerry Mitchell, a investigative worker for the Jackson Clarendon Ledger, published excerpts from a 1983 interview with Samuel Bowers. In the interview, Bowers states that Edgar Ray Killian had been the main instigator of the Mississippi burning case and had walked free from the courtroom. Mitchell had written extensively about the case for six years, and this statement was corroborated by the trial judge, prosecutor, as well as others involved. 
1999, Mississippi Attorney General Michael Moore announced that the state would be investigating the civil rights era murders of three civil rights workers in Neshoba County. After reviewing 40,000 pages of evidence, a grand jury in 2005 charged 80-year-old Edgar Ray Killian with murder. Although the other co-conspirators were still alive, the grand jury found insufficient evidence to indict them. The Killian murder trial was scheduled for June 13, 2005, with Killian attending in a wheelchair. The trial, which garnered national attention, featured testimony for Rita Bender, the widow of Michael Swerner, as well as several family members of the victims. On June 21, 2005, 41 years after the murder, Killian was found guilty of manslaughter and given the maximum sentence of 60 years in prison. His appeal, which claimed that no jury of his peers would have convicted him based on the 1964 evidence presented, was rejected by the Supreme Court in Mississippi. And Killian would die January 12, 2018, in Mississippi State Penitentiary in Parsha, Mississippi, at the age of 92. The Mississippi burning murders grabbed national headlines and shed a light on the civil rights struggle, dangerous and brutal nature. The national outrage over the murders and the federal government's involvement headline how widespread and duply rooted the issue of racial prejudice was. What struck the nation the most was not just the murders themselves, but the subsequent cover-up and the lengthy search that eventually led to their discovery. These murders marked a turning point for the civil rights movement as they brought the forefront to the grave risks faced by racial inequality and ignited a greater fervor and determination for both black and white Americans to stand up against racial discrimination in this country. Thank you. This has been One Mike History. I'm your host, Country Boy. If you like stories like this, you can find more stories like this at onemikehistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so on Buy Me Coffee and my Patreon page in the description below. Give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. Peace.